Welcome to the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top founders and experts in the e-commerce industry and take an in-depth look at the struggles and successes in growing e-commerce brands profitably. Right, and we're live. Hey guys, Josh Chin here. I'm the host of the E-Commerce Profits Podcast, where we feature top experts, entrepreneurs in the e-commerce industry and beyond. And we look behind the scenes of the struggles and successes of growing a brand. And today's episode is brought to you by Kronos Agency. If you run a direct to consumer e-commerce brand that's ready to scale and to double your lifetime profits, Kronos is the company for you. We've helped hundreds of brands um, scale email, SMS, and mobile push and scale profits through that way, getting an average of 3,500% ROI through our efforts. We've worked with brands like Truly Beauty, The Udi, Elias Skin, Dr. Living Good, and many, many more. Uh, the next step is to email us at sales at chronos.agency, or you can go to our, our website to check us out at chronos.agency. Today's guest is Dave Burchett, or David. Uh, now, David owns The Plug. That's a screen print shop currently with six locations uh, in Illinois and one in Colorado. And what's interesting is most recently, Dave has shifted his business to an online business model on top of his brick and mortar business. So now his revenue comes uh, basically 50-50 between online and offline. And his second business is called Avance. Uh, and that stands for an acronym. So we'll talk about that in a little, little bit is a business that he created to manufacture all the supplies for the plug. Um, so that's basically the supply chain, right, Dave? Exactly. That's our supply chain. Um, but also, it's also taken off into another turn. So we're also supplying our competitors as well. Because, you know, I love we have, that. Yeah, we Going have upstream, yeah. stores. We have all the advanced products. So people that are, you know, they rip a screen on a Friday. They can't wait till Monday to get another screen. They can just pop in and grab the products. So it's uh, it's actually uh, turned out pretty huge for us. That's beautiful. Well, welcome to the show, and thank you for for joining us. Um, I I want to kind of pick your mind a little bit. What what made you, what inspired you to make that shift online and upstream and supplying your competitors that way? Um. So when we first opened the first store, obviously we built it so we could replicate it. And, and um, you know, we, we knew we wanted to scale it out. Um, yeah. The number one thing that we saw was that as we went to scale, we were missing out on a lot of revenue by not having the supply chain intact. So uh, we wanted to, you know, manufacture our own products and stuff like that. So we went down that road. Um, it took about six months a year to get the get all a couple of our first initial products taken care of. Um but that was it was supposed to be the vehicle behind the plug. That was the idea. Um, but when we saw when we started supplying the stores, we saw a lot of competitors that had a real need for it. So we looked at it as that was a quick way to bro- grow, which was B2B, um, not necessarily mm. all like B2C or D2C, stuff like that. So B2B, is that is are these transactions done primarily online or are you yeah. still having people call up? Okay. No, no. So, you know, with the Shopify site, we can create, you know, um, uh, dealer portals and stuff like that. So they can log in. They can yeah. actually, so they get a different, you know, a different pricing rate because they're, they're spending so much in a quarter. So they're tiered by how much right. they spend it per quarter. Um, but right. You know, it's, it's all done online. I, I, I love that. So your stores are re- replicable and. Yeah. The six, the six stores in Illinois and one in Colorado, are, are these franchises or are they all kind well, of subsidiaries? Well, they franchises. So some of those, only three are corporate owned. The rest are all licensed out or franchised out. Okay. And you plan to grow more over uh, this year? Yeah, this um, year we're looking at 10 um, in, in a couple of different states, uh, as well as probably another 100 within the next three to five years. Right. This is top of mind for me because I, I have a, uh, you know, people have different opinions about this. VC, venture yeah. capital money. You're, you're considering taking venture capital money yeah. uh, to expand in your business. Why, why do that? Why not just grow true revenue and take a loan and running it that way? Well, 
so for one, we've been all self sufficient. So, uh, so you know, um, yeah, we've not borrowed any money. We have no no debt on the books. So we owe nobody. Um, That's awesome, dude. Yeah. So, but the whole idea is, I tell everybody when they start a business, don't ever start a business without an exit strategy. So mm. you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be 70 years old running around trying to open up these stores. Um, so. The idea is for me to build this. I gave myself a time limit. I'm going to build out as much as I can, create the value as high as possible. And in that way, I can exit and still keep out of some royalties and as well walk away with my own, you know, little nest egg. That, that's my pilot. That's my pilot goal at the end of the rainbow right there. Um, when you talk about venture capitalists, um, it just depends on the rate you want to grow. Um, they also bring certain value, so certain experience along with it. So, you know, you have some certain venture capitalists that own like, you know, 139 Dunkin' Donuts in seven different countries. You right. know, um, so when you're talking about overseas and you're talking about territories, they got that experience along with the money as well. So it's not always about money. You know, it's that's the key. Mm. Some people think it's, oh, uh, you know, you just want the money, this and that. You know, it's it's not necessarily about that. Um, it's right. the experience that, that comes behind with them working overseas, working in Canada, Mexico, and things like that. Okay, so what you're saying is that you're you're not just looking for money; you're looking for a partner that can help yeah. you scale and achieve your goals. Okay, right, well, strategic partner, correct? Right. Um, why, why, why not? Why not just that? Why not look for a strategic partner, um, or an individual, or, uh, or or a private equity firm? Why VC specifically? Is, do you have an a background in that in that space or experience with VC specifically. I know, specifically we that. do. Have, so we work with um, cultivated advisors, um, and it's mm. just that they have the right connections there. Uh, unfortunately, right. you know, it's hard to get certain connections when it comes to VC. Um, yeah. It's very very difficult. Um, right. And at the end of the day, you got to find the right partners. You got to find the right people to, to do business with. Um, but I know what my goal is. I know what my exit strategy where I want to be, and I think that's just the quickest route for us to go to get there. That makes sense. What What does your timeline look like? What is it? So, when does the next so, it happen? So I, I gave myself originally 10 years. Um, we're entering our fifth year. So okay. I got about five more. So I'm right on track where I want to be. Right. Um, but I do think I can, you know, we just did an evaluation now. And I think we're somewhere a little short of 8 million, um, right. which is fine for where we're at right now. But I think by the time we exit, we could be north of 20, 30 million. Gotcha. As a, as a valuation. As evaluation, correct. Okay, what are you doing in, in prep? Because I, I know that you're big on on, on SOPs and stand, uh, you know, training procedures, uh, um, and kind of duplicating a, a model that works regardless of who runs it. Correct. So, what are you doing in preparation of that exit? Because eventually, someone has to take your role as the owner and CEO. Right. So when you talk about evaluation, you talk about a multiplier, right? So they're going to look at your, your annual revenue sales and then you get a multiplier mm -hmm. with that. You know, usually it's two and a half times to six and a half times, right? Um, right. On the lower end, that means you're the person running everything. So like when you talk mm -hmm. to most business owners, I ask two questions. Can your business function without you? And most mm -hmm. time they say no, because they're doing, they're the essential key piece of the business, right? Um, yeah. And so that, to move that multiplier to a higher times, right, you know, is you have to be able to have process in place. You have to have leadership in place so that that business can function without you. On a day-to-day -day basis, can operations run without you? Do, or are you the one submitting all the purchase orders? Are you the mm -hmm. one doing all the accounts receivable, all accounts payable? You know, because some people think, well, I'm not, make, well, I'm not making the shirts. I'm not doing actual production, but are you doing all the administrative stuff? Are you doing the bookkeeping stuff? Or do you have people and processes in place to take care of it? That's the fastest way to move your multiplier, right? Now, the, the last part of that multiplier, if you want to get above five, that 5%, five comes right. the second question I ask everybody. All right, so the first one is, can your business function without you? The second, second question is, can your business grow without you? Right. So, like, that's key. You want to get above yeah. that 5%, you got to have certain processes and leadership in place that will steer your company in the right direction. You know, if it's just all you, then that evaluation is going to go down. So, as much, you know, so I know for me to be on point with my exit strategy, I have to keep implementing, I have to stay on course, I have to make sure it's bigger than me. Yeah, that makes sense. Where, where is this ambition coming from? I'm curious about your your background and and growing like 
take take us back five years back as okay. when you were planning out a ten year kind of time horizon. Right. So, what was your on your mind now? Um, I was an educator. I coached football, coached wrestling, uh, as well as taught special mm. ed um, in over in Illinois. Um, right. Basically, but my real background in business goes back earlier than that. When I was in college, I worked in operational management. My first degree is in operational management. So I understand how to run a business. I understand about production, training, and things like that. Um, I was hired by Browns. I, I was hired by Walgreens. And what I would do is I would go open up stores, staff them, train them. And then, you mm. know, whether it be the manager or be a franchisee owner, I train them and then I move on to the next store. And I would just keep opening right. up stores today. So that's how I knew how the business models should be look and what how it should, how it should function. Um, but when I was teaching, coaching, when I was uh, in that space, um, we started producing. We on the side, me and uh, one of my assistant coaches decided we could make our own stuff. So we started screen printing, and we did that for a good about six, seven years. Um, right. And then from there, when we decided, okay, we want to go into, you know, we want to scale this business bigger. Uh, we had to look at a bunch of different business models, right? You know, uh, and there's a lot of different directions you can go. So key things when we mapped it out was, you know, number one thing when you start a business, like I said, you want to make sure you have an exit strategy, all right? So once you map that out and say, okay, I got to build something that has standardized procedures, standardized pricing, standardized training, things like yeah. that. So we mapped it out. Um, the next thing we have to look at is what are our differentiators? What separates us from what everybody else is doing? Right. And what, you know, because like most places, so like in our industry with the custom apparel, it's just mom and pop shops, right? Yeah. Why would somebody buy that store, you know, when they can just go buy $20,000 worth of equipment and, and mm. just start their own? So right. what are our differentiators? Where do we separate? So what gives us value? So mm -hmm. that's what we have to, we had to create, we had to sit down. We went through a bunch of stuff like that. And that's why we decided to go in the direction we went in. All our stores are print on demand. All our stores carry stock. Um, our stores have contracts, which is unusual in this space because most places mm -hmm. don't do contracts. We, right. we lock certain school districts in, certain businesses into contracts. So all that creates value for each store. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's what, when we, before we opened, it probably took maybe a year of planning, a year to make sure that, you know, I want to make sure that 10 years was right on point. Right. I want to make sure I could exit and not just say, here, I want 20 million and nobody wants to pay for it. Right. Yeah. Are are, are you running this, the, the company alone do you, or do you have partners involved in the business? So I, I do have for the plug. I am 100 percent owner for advance. I do have a partner. Um, right. Uh, Aisha Montgomery, who is an economist, a former senior VP for Northern Trust. Um, mm. So she brings a lot of uh, business and accounting uh, experience to, to the table. You know what? That, that That's really impressive for a couple of reasons. Now, one, most brick and mortar businesses struggle to venture online, let alone think about an exit. Right. I'm, I'm curious about where, where this is all uh, where, where this all comes from and where do you learn all of this? Well, my, like I said, my first degree was in business management, operational management. So I had, you know, a lot of experience in that aspect. Um, I will say most business owners don't plan. They yeah. don't. They, if they do, it's very, very rudimentary. It's, you know, you know, I think I want to do this and I'm going to do this and this and this. There's no right. strategic planning behind it. There's no, like, they don't put forethought as far as, like, what are your adversities going to be, you know, where are your opportunities are going to grow. How, you know, not just what are your revenue streams, but how are you going to build out your different revenue streams? Mm. You know, things like that. What Not only what is your, your marketing, but what is your marketing budget? What is your marketing strategy? You know, these are things right. that people fail to plan out. Now, I will say this, though, like, when I first opened, number one thing I did was I took online classes. I went to Marine Valley, took classes on with uh, on there. Um, I'm a big proponent of the city, you know, for, I don't know if you sure know what, like, the city colleges are, the junior colleges. Right, yeah. You yeah. Know, and I'll, I'll tell you why, like, I think they're so great. You know, if I, I don't need to go there to get a degree. I have three degrees, right? So I don't right. need another degree. What I need, though, is I need help in advertising and marketing when I first opened, right? I knew mm -hmm. kind of what my strategy was, but I need help with implementation. 
Well, when you go to the junior colleges, they're not just taught by professors. You're talking by working professionals. Perf- so yeah. when you take a marketing advertising class, you're going to get somebody at night that's that throughout the day, that's what they're doing. They're running the marketing yeah. advertising agency. So I yeah. would take the classes and it costs like 300 bucks for a semester. Right. But not only did I get like the information in the class, but I got an advisor basically. Because they love to hear about like what you're doing, and you know, right. we tell them like, here, this is what I'm trying to do, and I know like you know, you build out your avatar. This is your target market audience, right? They would yeah. help me build out my avatar. They would help me right. build out, like now I identify my target market audience. How do I go ahead and go about achieving that? Um, yeah. And I would do that for a lot of things: bookkeeping. I would take classes. Um, I would take classes on evaluation, things like that, any type of business course. But anytime I felt like I wanted to get in front of a working professional. That was the yeah. best way. Because if you pay for these people, I mean, you're talking about thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. You know? For consult- cons- consultations, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That is so smart. That's a good hack. That's, a, That's such great. a good hack. Um, it's up people all the time. Go to, the people look down on junior college. They don't realize yeah. that's how you get a, an advisor for a good four or five months. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And yeah. get to ask questions and, and they love subsidized. It. And, yeah. Oh, they man. love it too. Those um, teachers love it. Because you don't get a lot of people in, in, oh. in, you know, in these colleges or any college for that matter that who are actually running a business or, or doing. Well, who care? Most of them are taking the class to satisfy a credit. You know, when you get That's somebody, true, yeah. when you get somebody in there cares. and they really want that information, they don't care about the credit. They want the information as for an educator. That's, that's gold. very yeah yeah they, like, they get pumped behind. I, I mean, I've had some teachers that to this day I still talk to. You know, I can call them for anything. But they that love is it. smart. They, they watch us grow. They watch how they see their impact on it. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, that is really, really smart. Um, out here in, in Singapore, we call them adjunct professors. Mm-hmm. People who are practitioners may not be a full time professor, um, but bring in the real world experience of you know mm-hmm. running a business or doing what they do. Uh, those are the best because you oh, kind of get are. to see how theories are being implemented in, in, in the real world. What? What else are you planning to do um, in launching the 10 franchises in 2023? So you have a, a, a couple of states that I see here listed, Texas, Kansas, yep. Ohio, and Tennessee. Tennessee, correct. In, in my mind, all right, this is, gonna, this is gonna sound dumb, right? But in my mind, the, the hardest part is getting the, the playbook ready, getting the playbook down. And it sounds like you have the playbook. You have the setting, the, the SOPs. You have the training manuals. You have the the marketing plan, and basically everything that you need to launch a franchise is is there. Yep. It it, it sounds like if you want if you wanted to launch like a hundred new franchises, it's basically a copy and paste it type is. of a situation. What's what's stopping you from doing more than ten? Um. Well, it's, it comes out to picking the right ownership, right? So obviously in the beginning, those first right. 10 are important because that's what's going to, you know, your success is dictated on those numbers. Mm. I, you know, I can't have any failures within there. So it's better to slow down in the beginning so you so can go past. Okay. Once I get past these 10, I we can ramp it up and we'll get to 100, like I said, within three to five years. But these right. first 10 have to be on point. Right. Um, right. You talked about the SOP training manuals and everything, you know, all of that, your bookkeeping. The one thing I tell people is. As you're building out your business, document it. That's mm-hmm. how you build this stuff out. That's how you're building training. So every, like when I started off the first store, it was just me. So I'm making sure I'm the employee. So now I have to document what my expectation, how long does it take for me to make this type of shirt? How long does it take mm-hmm. for me to do rhinestones, to do embroidery? So now I know what level of expectation to put on an employee, right? I can't say, well, I need you to do this over in 10 minutes. And it's not even possible. You know what I'm saying? But what is that? What is that like? Is that is that a, a Google Doc or is that like a handwritten type of situation? Or well, are you how using, I like, did it was I used yeah I did Google Sheets. So I mm. used the Google Drive because it's free, right? When you start yeah. off a business, you got to find every free Smart. tool available. Yeah. So with your Google account, you get the Drive, and on there is Google mm-hmm. Sheets. So I would there I would just keep a spreadsheet. You know, this is what it looks like for the morning person. This is what it looks like for a person closing. You know, and right. then obviously as I started to hire employees, I move into the assistant manager role, right? So right. now I'm not doing everything. Now I'm assisting and I'm mm. building out that as well. I'm documenting this is what assistant manager. And then as I hired an assistant manager, I moved to the manager role. 
You know what I'm saying? So I'm built, I built right. out every single role, but I knew the importance of building out the role. I need to document it. So this way, when somebody, when they, when the franchise owner in, they know this is the time frame I need to hire my first employee. This is the amount of revenue I need. This is because you want to keep your payroll in a certain percentage, right? So this is this is really good. I I I'm I'm curious about how you deal with deal with the issue of because we we have a very extensive training course that's internal that, that contains SOPs, guides, yeah. and, and videos. I'm sure you have all of those as well over right. like so many years. The challenge that I face is that it gets outdated so quickly that we now have like 24 modules of of information each being two hours worth of information so it's going to take someone 48 hours to complete which is impossible while you're kind of working full time how do you how do you make sure that the the information in the playbook remains relevant and effective as you scale your business well, that's the key, though. To you have to put the policy and procedures in place and make them standard. This is it. So, you know, I don't really foresee like any of our training procedures or our operating procedures become outdated. Now, we might have to make a few tweaks here and there, but not on a large scale. Um, right. You know, so but we make sure every employee is doing it the same way. And what we do mm -hmm. is we do quarterly reviews. So I'll we'll hire an employee and then every quarter they get a review and they get a raise. But it's basically going back and making sure they're following our policies and procedures. That's very, very important. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, you've got to make it standard and you kind of got to stick to it. If you're constantly right. revisiting everything, uh, there's something wrong there. Um, you should mm -hmm. have to only tweak a few things here and there, if, 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 if that. That makes sense. So one of the... One of the workarounds that we've we've done a couple of learnings over over the years uh, is that one you kind of never want to have these SOPs and guides be too specific, right? Especially with tasks that are not repetitive. For example, marketing. Right. We we kind of want to be um, comprehensive enough. But not specific that it boxes up our our cool. people and you know specific steps because contexts change pretty quickly. Um, so we want to we want to incorporate that flexibility in it. So that's that's a big learning point. And then the the second thing that we've learned is that as as we 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 scale, the people running the processes should also have the authority and responsibility to update those processes as they discover better ways of doing things. Right. And so then it becomes a living is, document. Right. What you're talking about is ownership. And, and you have yeah. to give that person ownership because that they, they'll be, they'll take it and run with it, right? Um, you don't want a robot. You know, that, I mean, it's just not pop, I mean, it's not what anybody, I mean, people think they do want robots. Trust me, you don't. You need somebody that's going to function in real time and it, it be able to analyze situations, solve problems as they come up. Yeah. So, um, that that is key. Now, Dave, let's let's take a quick segue here. Um, events. So, t tell me. You, you mentioned this before we we hit record, but tell tell listeners what events stands for and how do you end up in the in this business, especially when it's so different from your core business and, and the plug. How do you make that that shift? So for us, again, like we wanted the vehicle for the plug. You know, we didn't want somebody else to be our supply chain. We wanted, mm -hmm. that was the best way for us to control quality, to control the product, to make sure everything was consistent. And, you know, obviously when you control your own manufacturing, you control turnaround time. So like yeah. for us, that was huge. Um, Advance, our major product is vinyl. So heat transfer yeah. vinyl. That's our number one product. We also do screens and inks and everything else. But the word, that's where Advance comes from. We, there's an acronym saying all vinyl are, it means all vinyl are not created equal. Mm. And the reason for that is when we made, we started manufacturing the products, we saw yeah. there was a very small price difference in just getting the more higher quality product. So we went right. on that. We said we're going to get the higher quality product, but we're going to offer it at the same market standard price that's out there. So, um, And that's why we want to make sure we live up to that name. 
We're going to have the best quality for the, for the most standard price. We're not going to charge you a premium. And, and that's what separates us. Again, we needed differentiators, right? That's what separates yeah. us from everybody else. That's that's smart. And I, I presume that this also adds val- adds, to, adds to the value of the business as well. Because not every of you know, screen print shop has control over the supply chain and often relies on the third party. Whereas you do and you have that entire kind of vertical integration in place. What is the next five year five years look like? So you have the you have the retail down pat, you have the supply chain like right before that down pat. Right. Are you do you do you plan on going even further down the supply chain or are you right. expanding horizontally? No. So we're we're gonna um move to a bigger platform with advance so we can create a a, a more direct B2B um, service. So okay. again, we're looking to supply like almost every screen printer over here, every, you know, so every type of vinyl shop and things like that. So we're going to, we're, you know, as, like I said, when we first started off, we were probably 89% brick and mortar. Now we're yeah. 50%, but we expect that to keep going in that direction online. Um, obviously right. it gives us the, l- the largest reach because we're, you know, we just recently started servicing companies like Germany, Australia. Mm. So, you know, as we break into different markets, um, right. we expect our online presence to be bigger. Interesting. Now, what do you foresee as some of the, the, the hurdles or key bottlenecks that you have, to, you would have to overcome in the, in the next one year in order for you to achieve your, your, your goals of 10 franchisees? Well, the 10, I, I, I don't really, it's not an issue. We'll have the 10. Right. Uh, we got most of them already signed up. Uh, okay. We, we created the, the Colorado stores become like we create that to be like our training ground. So that's where right. everybody will come to train, um, even though they're in different states. So I have to come here for three weeks and they'll, yeah. they'll spend five days a week, four, 40 hours a week training, um, preparing mm-hmm. to open their store. Um, as far as like what our bottlenecks are going to be, um, we're going to, uh, eventually we're going to need warehouses and that's our next step for advance. Cause even though online's, you know, present, you know, we we have the one warehouse in Illinois, we're going to need other strategic warehouses throughout the country so we can yeah. improve that turnaround time. You know, if they're coming from, if we open a one in California and it's got to come all the way from Illinois, that's a four day ship. So ideally we right. want something on the West coast for a, a warehouse and then somewhere down South. Hmm. Gotcha. So you're covering the entire country. What what does that look like in, in terms of turnaround time when the when you have that all built up? We should look at a day or two turnaround time. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's that's really quick because, um, from 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 my understanding of what uh, how, how the print on print on demand demand industry works, it's typically like a five to seven day turnaround yeah. time. That's that's pretty standard. Yeah. So even four days seems pretty quick. How, how are you getting that so done so quickly? So if you come in store, we could do it same day. Your one or two days we're talking about is because of shipping. Right. But I'll tell you why our turnaround time is faster. It's because everything is done in-house. We don't outsource. Okay, so you just companies, break. Yep. Majority of so, companies so- that are dealing five, seven, or two weeks turnaround time is because yeah. of outsourcing a lot of it. Right. Okay. Or they have to order the apparel and they have to wait for the apparel to come in. That makes yeah. We manufacture apparel. We have the apparel already on hand. We wait okay. for nothing. We have the apparel. We have the screens. We have the inks. If they need a certain color, they got to go order it. Wait for that to come in. Mm. We have it already. So with us having the manufacturing and the supplies all in house, and then us doing yeah. all the production in house, that's how you get to be that that fast of a turnaround time. Right. Do, do you think that serves as a moat? For your business, because not everybody can can do that. It, it, it sounds like it takes a lot of money. Um, we started. We opened the first store with twenty thousand, and then right. self finance from there. But we we didn't for the first year. We didn't take any money out. Everything got re- wow, reinvested okay. in. We knew what nice. we were getting to. We know we know it takes money when you get into supplies and you get into products. That's where the real yeah. money comes in for your inventory. But like our first run when we did the inventory was like ten grand. It wasn't a lot. It was right. it was enough to get going. Right. And from there, 
profits reinvested in, inventory grows, you move into new SKU numbers, new product lines. You know, the key is for people, you just have to start somewhere. You don't have, I, I never recommend anybody going out taking loans. Well, I need $100,000. Mm-hmm. That's great. But what happens is while you're going through that growth process, while you're going through that, you know, you know, that initial phase, you're learning a lot about, you know, what to do, and what not to do. When you deal with a very little bit of money, you're going to be very fiscally responsible because you mm-hmm. only have a limited amount of money. This is all I got. So I know I, I got to make sure when you're dealing with a lot of money, people just kind of just order whatever. And they don't take those those learning lessons as hard or uh, that they those experiences that come. They don't really take them because, you know, they're dealing with a lot of money. It's always best to start off small and build those building blocks. And then once you got it down, you can really ramp up because your your profits coming in are going to keep increasing, increasing, increasing. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm now. What are some of the the lessons that you've learned in the past five years, or, or or maybe in the past one year, since things have changed so drastically, that you feel made the biggest impact in in how you conduct your business today? Networks. Everybody hmm. should be looking for con- connectors and multipliers. Everybody. Connectors. Yeah, at the end of the day. You know, when you join networks and you join like Chamber of Commerces or your business yeah. network, something like that, you're looking to connect with people. And then there's certain people that will help you connect with other people. Right. Those are connectors. Right. right? So if I mm-hmm. join a, a Chamber of Commerce and I'm the only printer in that Chamber of Commerce, I'm looking to connect with them and I'm looking to be their printer. Right. Yeah. Um, but now if I join a Chamber of Commerce and I come across a bookkeeper or somebody who does market advertising. So they do market advertising. They have their own list of clients, right? And those right. are called multipliers because now they're going to say like, here, I can say, here, I'll give you a commission, 5% of every order, every client you bring me because they're going to go to their client saying, well, if you need apparel, if you need business cards, I got a guy for you. You can go over here to yeah. plug. That's a multiplier. So if you really want to grow really, really fast to get off the bat to, to get your clientele up, you want to join networks. And what you're looking for is connectors and multipliers. What are multipliers? How do, you, how do you define that? Multiplier is a person that has their own list of clientele. So it's not just me connecting. So if you if you did uh, marketing advertising and I connect with you, I'm not just looking for your order. I'm looking for you to introduce me to all your clientele. So you right. can, so if you have a clientele, you say you have a book of 100 people and they do all various things, but they all need like work pillows. And you right. introduce it. I'm going to, that's, I'm going to get access to hopefully 50 to 100 of your clients that actually need business cards or need polos or need some form of printing. That's a multiplier. Somebody who has their own clientele, their own book, and they're willing to introduce you to them in some way or some form. You can use compensation models, you know, as far as like right. you want to give them commission or you want to give them a finder's fee or a little kickback or something like that. But, um, yeah, that's that's what a multiplier is. Makes sense. Makes sense. Sort of like a like an affiliate, like a super affiliate. A super affiliate. Yeah, I would say definitely. Okay. Um, now, let's let's talk a little bit about the 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 road ahead and what your ambitions look like once the five years are up. Right. So there's right. there's a 10 year process. You're in the middle of it um, yeah. and you're on track. It seems it's it sounds like you're, you're just going to you're going to reach your goal. Right. It's, it's consistency. Right. You're going to get there. At, at that point, what, what do you see that's beyond that? What, what are your ambitions beyond selling the business? Um, for me, it's probably getting back into coaching and giving back there. So I have a long list of obviously people I want to take care of and things I want to do. I would love to see uh a youth wrestling training facility in Chicagoland area. You know, I, so I look to build that out. Um, right. I think that'll be the part of my life where I get to like really give back to people that help me get, get to this point. So, um, you know, I'm really appreciative of all the help and support that, uh, that we achieved over the last five years and what we'll get in the next five years. But I think that's my, my, my opportunity to get back into the sport of wrestling and sports in general. Interesting. Get, so, and and 
you, you're not, it, it sounds like you're not waiting all the way till like five years from now. It, we, we haven't talked about this, but I, I know that you have a program that's pretty smart that supports local businesses at the same time, drives customers and loyalty into your business right. called Plug Bucks. Yeah. Is that still implemented? And can you tell, tell, tell right. us more about that? So, um, again, when we talk about building networks, what I wanted to do in like, you know, in the communities that stores are in was um, mm -hmm. we need to feed off each other. So the whole idea of the plug box is, you know, the store, I would get small businesses that the, the, the cooperate and they would go mm -hmm. into these plug box. So if they spent like over $60, you would get five plug box. Um, right. People can buy the plug box, but you could take these plug box and use them at any of the participating businesses. Now, what happens is people take these bucks and they go to, like, say, down to Barocco's uh, in Mount Greenwood. They go down the street. They use them mm -hmm. there. Um, they get them back. So what happens is it's me sharing my clientele with that business. And right. if they purchase the plug bucks there at, say, Barocco's or Diggy Dogs or, or uh, Gyro Grill, they get to bring them back down to the plug. That's them sharing their clientele with me. So, right. you know, because be, even though you're in a small area, You'd be amazed yeah. how many people just go to the business they want. And here's yeah. a way for businesses to participate with each other and share their clientele with each other. That's smart. So you kind of built a localized loyalty program. Correct. With multiple players involved. So you Correct. have that network effect that plays Correct. out. Is this, is this implemented only at, at the, the location near you or is that a part of a franchise uh, playbook? No, so we started in Mount Greenwood. Now we're doing it in Colorado. It's going to be a part of everybody's playbook. Um, you know, obviously with the stores open up, we're we're very heavily involved with community, and so that's what yeah. we're trying to promote. We're trying to promote small businesses. We're trying to promote us working together, not against each other. We're not competitors here, right? Yeah. You know, there's more enough money to go around. What we should be doing is sharing our clients out with each other, so everybody can succeed. I I, I love that, man. I. You know, while you're explaining that, I was thinking if this is, this could be converted to an online context where, you know, every brand has their loyalty programs and, and their, their cash back and, and whatnot. What if it was a loyalty program for a group of brands that are owned by different people, but share a very similar audience that could easily double, triple, four X. Yeah. your audience just by doing that yeah that, that's pretty so smart that's pretty do smart it all the time so like if you see again we're talking about networking people undervalue that people feel like i gotta do everything myself i gotta go out there i don't want you know or this person's my competition if you look at our website we have other businesses that are connected to our website so if you go on the plug you'll see yaz inc you'll see glitzy blingware so people can click on that and it goes directly to their website but if you go on their websites, you'll see the plug, you'll see advance. Right. And people connect and it goes directly to our website. You know, you have to like find those connectors, you know, and from there, that's how you grow. Because it's just opportunity to get in front of different people. I tell people always, I tell people this all the time. When I, speak to them, I say pour into someone who will pour into you. And I spell out right. pour. Pour is P-O-U-R. P for provide. O for offer, you uplift, R rebuild. And that's what we have Love to that. do. We have to pour into each other. But don't pour into somebody who's not going to reciprocate. We got to right. be for each other. I got to see you want to win, and I got to see me want to win. Poor. I love that. Dude, you're the king of acronyms, man. Yeah. I love <laughs> it. I love it. And it's so easy to remember. Um, yeah. Thank you. And this is a, a good time to... Um, for for people listening, wanting to get in touch with you, maybe learn a, lo a little bit more about your franchising opportunities and um, and what you do, where can they connect with you? They can go to vancevinyl.com, A-V-A-N-C-E-V-I-N-Y-L.com, or they can go on to the plug t-shirt store.com. Um, either one of those will have all the information. They'll, they'll get to check out about us um, and see everything we're doing. Stay up to front. Perfect. They, they can As also usual. check us on Links Facebook. Links will be in the... Links will be in the description below. If you're on Spotify, go on chronos.agency forward slash podcast and you'll see all the links over there. Sorry, go ahead. Now, as I said, it catches on, uh, on, on Facebook as well for an Instagram for the plug t-shirt store in advance final. 
Um, we're on TikTok as the original plug. Perfect. Dave, it's been a pleasure. You got yeah. so many hidden and really interesting gems that I, I'm personally going to try out myself. Thank you very much. Well, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a joy having you on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening to the e-commerce profits podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get notified of future episodes.